that one day he said that if we can, if we can only get 10% of the wealth, leave it in the ground. And, and, and uh, so Kwame said that, say Kutore, said to him that if we bring the wealth out, the Europeans are going to take it from us. We don't have the skilled people to manage it and make it a benefit for the African economy. So uh, uh, Sekou Touré left the wealth in the ground. Kenny is rich, rich, rich. You got, you got a, a man in there that needs some adjustment, Conte, because he allows the Americans, starting with David Rockefeller, started with him a long time ago, and they cultivated him. And I'm only saying this because this is a system that's used in the Western world. Lugar, and you put the figures down, they controlled 11 million acres, 400 million people. How did a small British empire do it? Lugar said that, let's find out how do the Africans rule. Once we find out how they rule, then we can find out how to divide them and rule over them. He said they rule through council. They consult with one another. The chiefs bring the information from the far places and they sit down in what we call in Islam, sure. And they take that information and they use that to rule. So the British Lugar in the league said, what about if we can isolate the leader, get his counselors away from him, control him, then we can control the masses of people. This enemy, a man named Richard Pipes, anybody know that name? Go online. Richard Pipes has a son named Daniel Pipes. Richard Pipes is the one that came up, how do we dismantle the Soviet Union? That's right. He said the first thing we got to do is get them to argue with one another. Mm -hmm. And then we got to bring in leaders that we cultivate that's more pliant to our ideas. Then we thrust those leaders in. They used an experiment on Yugoslavia and look at the mess and the chaos that they made out of Yugoslavia. They have in mind the same thing for Africa. This is why this yin and yang with the African Union, because if they can divide us first, prop up leaders that they want, and have us fighting with one another. The cartoon idea of cartoons of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came from Daniel Pipe's interview with Ross Flemings, the editor of the paper in Denmark. That's the root of it, and they said, we're going to roll this out under the guise of democracy, showing that freedom of speech, freedom of expression is the hallmark of uh, democracy, and we will not be self-centered, self-censored, censored, excuse me, by these Muslims and their view on Prophet Muhammad. We'll try it in Denmark, and then we'll roll it across Europe, and now the Muslims are divided. There's the one saying, we shouldn't be so militant, we should be nice. There's the other one said we should burn it down. So now, while they're divided and arguing with one another, they find compliant Muslim leaders like the King of Jordan and get them on this side, get them fight and divide them, and then rule over them. Thank you, God bless you. That's my name. First of all, brothers and sisters, you know, they said I had uh, 15 minutes uh, to speak. I'd like to give each one of these brothers five of those minutes and let them keep going. But I'm not going to do that because I came all the way from New York City. Because i got to say something to you. But I wanted to say this, that I am humbled to be up here with these brothers, many of them who I've known for a long time, and to be with you. Because every elected official should come back home and get their Pan-Africanist roots in place before they go back out and do the work. And I also I want to say in the 60s, I was in the Black Panther Party. We were Pan-Africanist, revolutionary nationalists as a, pan as a, a panther, and I'm that as a city councilman in New York City. I'm still a Pan-Africanist, revolutionary nationalist. And when I grow up, I want to be just like Cynthia McKinney. And I want to say that President Bush, because I'm going to win the congressional seat, guess who's coming to dinner? And when I get there, I'm going to rock the house. But I did want to say uh, to Minister Akbar Muhammad, this is not going to be the kind of race 
where you cannot be in front with the nation of Islam because you're trying to get some white votes mm -hmm. and you don't want to hurt me. In New York City, whites don't vote for us. David Dinkins is the kindest, gentlest, nicest black man we can give whites. They didn't vote for him. If David Dinkins only got 24% of the white vote, 76% of the whites in New York City in the Democratic Party said no to David Dinkins? I can forget it. If they're not voting for David Dinkins, I'm not even trying. So in New York City, where I'm running, 60% of the district is Africans, 16% is white, and 16% is Latino. I already have my entire city council district is in that congressional district. So I've already gotten 10,000 votes in that district. We want to change the kind of politics we do in New York City. New York City is the number one city in the world. We have 2.3 million African people in New York City. 2.3 million African people in New York City. The United Nations is in New York City. The world financial capital of the world, Wall Street, the stock market, in New York City. New York City has a $55 billion budget. $55 billion. New York City's budget is larger than every African nation's budget. You'd have to couple 10, 15 countries together to get the $15 billion New York City budget. New York City's budget is larger than 48 states in the United States. There's only two states, California and New York State itself, that has a larger budget than New York City. And we sit in there, 2.3 million African people. And if you put people to, of color together, 65% of New York City is people of color. Whites are minorities, but to keep us in a minority mentality, they call us the majority minority. No, you're the minority and we're the majority. And I tell my white friends, when I become mayor, you're gonna need affirmative action. When I become mayor, because I'm gonna go from Congress to mayor. When I become mayor of New York City, I'm going to change the, the mistake that David Dinkins made is he didn't change the infrastructure. I'm going to change everything. That's why I told black people, I'm going to talk for you in New York. I'm not even fronting. I'm letting everybody know I'm going to take care of you. So you better come out and work at numbers. When I finish setting up my administration after Congress and I'm mayor, I'm telling all the commissioners in New York City, turn in your letters of resignation. Because I'm going to find every black person I can find. <laughs> and when the whites say, but Mayor Barron, isn't that racism in reverse? I'm going to tell them color doesn't matter. <laughs> We're making the issue of color. I hired the most qualified people I can find. They just so happen to be black. I'm going to tell them, give me four more years and I'll try to find a qualified white. It's gradualism. It takes a lot of time. Just, just work with me. And I'm going to let them know that in New York City, I, I told everybody, I said, you'll know when I win the mayor on TV. Just turn off your TVs on the night of the election and go to Kennedy Airport and see if it's a normal day. If you don't see whites leaving in droves, I lost. If you see them taking off, I won. But I want to let everybody know this is a very serious campaign in New York City. I could do this congressional thing, but Minister Muhammad is correct. I got to come to you for some money. Because what they keep saying to me, you're not going to be able to raise the money. So I get cute and back. I said, money doesn't vote, people vote. You count the dollars, I'm counting the people. But that's for the media. For you, I need them dollars. I'm 
just fight for them. Because we're going to build a people's movement and win. And when we get there, we got to make some serious changes. We got this brother, well, we got Ed Towns in Congress. This is a man who's just a, an embarrassment to New York City. An embarrassment to New York City. And we got to make the kind of changes. So when they talk about free trade, we're talking about fair trade. There ain't nothing free about trade. That's what they're trying to do to Africa. They want to turn it into a free trade zone. They want to privatize the economy and military, build military bases throughout Africa. We have to say no to that. When I brought Robert Mugabe to City Hall, they had a fifth. I thought they should be proud. Little old East New York, Brooklyn, Councilman bringing the head of state to, they had a fit. They said they called me everything but a child of God. I have to look up in the dictionary to get all the names that they call me. My wife is an educator. My vocabulary is very limited. But one of the papers called me terminally odious. And I thought that they were saying I stink terminally. Like I had a terminally bad odor. And I was ready to fight. And then when my wife told me, no, they just said that you're terminally evil, I said, oh, okay, that's all right. They're not just saying I stink. But I beat the machine to get into New York City Council. The whole Democratic black machine was against me, and we won because we built a people's movement. And when I went into City Hall, one of the first things I did, little things they don't want you to do. I just did a simple thing. I saw all the pictures on the wall were white men from the colonial period. And they had Thomas Jefferson and people like that. So I said, how come we just have white men up on the walls? Put some brothers and sisters up on the wall. Put Adam Clayton Powell up there. Put um, Harriet Tubman up there. Put Malcolm X, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Put them up on the wall. They did some great things in New York City. They said I was terminally odious. <laughs> then, when I said, um, we should free political prisoners, brothers and sisters in the 60s that fought for our freedom and our liberation and languishing in, in prisons, free political prisoners, I was terminally odious. When they said, I said, reparations, the Jews got theirs, the Japanese got theirs, it's time for the Africans to get out. We deserve our fair share. New York City was built by Africans. The burial ground, we have 427 bones that are built under City Hall and 2,000 others of our ancestors. We built the roads, the bridges, we built their homes, we fed them, we did a lot of foolishness. We even fought with them. And now the African in New York deserves their reparations. But we want to go to Congress so we can say to this nation, I changed the name of the hurricane. For the first time in the history, we're going to give a hurricane a first name and a last name. And that's Hurricane FEMA Bush. Because that's what destroyed us. Katrina didn't do it. And if you can impeach Clinton for Monica, then you need to impeach Bush for Katrina. Because this is a crime against humanity. And we're going to take that up with the UN. So I don't want to waste the time because I know you had a lot of good stuff and I learned a lot here today. But I just wanted to say that the Big Apple is in the house. We never got a bite. But we're going to come back to New York City and we're going to rock that place because we've got to get revolutionaries elected to political office. Thank you very much. Yeah. Give them some love. Come on now. Come on now. Stand up. Stand up and give them some love. That's right. That's right. Give them some love. This is a panel. I'm the African. Africa is in the U.S. The role in the African Union. Now, brothers and sisters, I know a whole bunch of you are just hungry right now. That's right. Some good food is out there. And yes, we're going to take a quick break. About 15 to 30 minutes. But before we do that, we have with us a great representative from Zimbabwe. All the way from the Embassy of Zimbabwe, we have Just watch out for them. Come on now, please. 
Express Ride. All the way from the embassy to Washington, D.C. I don't want, I don't want to use Wilbur. I was, I was, I don't, I don't want to use the European stuff. That's right, that's right. So we will start out with the ambassador's representative speaking with us as we open up and we move right through what you have with Prince Ram, uh, with uh, the Cardinal and others who will be speaking. And of course, we're going to have some more good words from these wonderful speakers. Give yourself a hand, the Africans. Come on now. Give yourself some love. And of course, we're going to have Dan Jones and we're going to have others come up and speak at the next session we have. Brothers and sisters, please take a break, support the vendors, get some nourishment, and please return to your seat. We have about 15 to 30 minutes to do this. My name is Adam Lawson and I am a poet. And I've been asked to share a poem with you that I wrote actually in 2001 and I adapted it in 2002. Uh, to speak to my African consciousness, and it's entitled Sacred Africans. Let us steal our minds and know that we are sacred Africans. One river, many wells. We are the mod of the universe and only eternity can tell the number of ancestral lives we have inhabited throughout this vast course called space and time. We are sacred Africans, known by many names to awaken community, ritual, initiation, restoration, re-Africanization, all gifts inside, each of us, a sleeping African, it is time to awaken and be found a powerful life force of the indigenous African spirit, where spirituality emanates from the balancing of heart and mind. We are sacred Africans. The rhythm of the universe, the eternal clock of all time, the backdrop against which the flow of energetic life repeats our present moment. Repeats our present moment. Repeats our present moment to advance us to a higher state of living life. We are the state of being. Let us join forces and be found. Sacred Africans resonating with the quintessence of the one, mod mind, and act with in reciprocal harmony, where higher consciousness abounds in the rich, flowing, clear currents of one river, many wells. Ashe. Greetings. my truly beautiful black African peoples. Yeah. I figured I better holler at you right. Yeah. I'm Dazon Dixon Jalo and I am giving thanks for being here and for being with you and for you being here with all of us. I am the host and producer of Sisters Time on WRFG 89.3 FM. Yeah. I also am founder and president of Sister Love, which is a local HIV AIDS African women's reproductive health nonprofit. Where we work here and in the African diaspora of women on the continent and in South America as well as the Caribbean. And it's my pleasure to, of course, remind y'all that if you really are a part of the revolution, whether you're on the front lines or whether you're in the troops waiting to step up, whenever your sergeant, your captain, your general comes and says, I need you to go up front, take care of that matter right there, you better stand up, salute, and say what you need from me and where you want me to show up. Yeah. So I've been given the charge to facilitate this afternoon's conversation, and I'm really thankful for that. 
I want to first, uh, for next, and I first want to say one more time, y'all, Sister Adama set us up right for this next session. Give thanks, Sister, please. <laughs> At the moment, I would like to go ahead and call up Reverend Ajabu. And he will introduce for us the next extremely powerful speaker we're hearing from today. How's everybody this evening? It is a pleasure and an honor to be able to introduce to you and present to you the representative political counselor from the great country of Zimbabwe. Y'all can clap on that. Amen. Amen. See, in my humble opinion, when you talk about the forefront of the struggle for African people on the African continent, it's Robert Mugabe. And so I had the pleasure, and you have the pleasure, that we can help that country. Because there is a, a move to try to divide us from that country. We have to bring it together. The NAACP was the official monitor from the UN for the 2002 presidential elections in Zimbabwe. America wanted to be there. Britain wanted to be there. President Mugabe says, we're not going to let white folks determine whether our election is free and fair. Say, if anybody determines whether our election is free and fair, it would be black folks. They went to the Congressional Black Caucus first, and the Congressional Black Caucus declined. The NAACP stepped up. But now they won't release their report. We have to make them release the report. Because they're not releasing the report, Britain and the United States are saying that the election is not free and clear and are blocking loans that the government needs, the government of Zimbabwe needs to put its agricultural, agricultural infrastructure back in place. When President Mugabe said the land has to go back to black hands, the white settlers that was on the lands sabotaged the infrastructure. We have a petition. We need for you to sign the petition so that we bring ourselves together, not let them separate us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So see me. And if you got email addresses, then we can do this online. Without further ado, I present to you Brother Wilbur Gashavanu. Did I say that right, brother? Y'all give him a hand. Y'all give him a hand. Give him a stand. Y'all give him a hand. This man represents Brother Robert Mugabe. It's a heavy responsibility to bear Zimbabwe, 
But I'm happy today, it's a, it is an opportunity for me to be among brothers and sisters here in the uh, Atlanta. It's my first time to be in Atlanta. My ambassador sends his apologies. He's unable to come. So right. <coughs> ambassador Makranga is unable to come. He has sent his apologies. Um, his inability to come, his failure to come opened an opportunity for me to be among my brothers and sisters as well and to be among the best brains from the sixth region of Africa. I'm heartened actually to learn that uh, you are with Zimbabwe. Yes, sir. You are with Zimbabwe. Because Zimbabwe did what has not been done, uh, it set the precedence for the emancipation, economic emancipation of blacks in Africa and beyond. By taking the land, it's an event, it's, a, it's an event and a process which has not been witnessed ever the transfer of 11 million hectares of land from the few privileged whites to the majority blacks had never happened in the history of post-colonial Africa or anywhere else in the world. And that is the core of the problem, the core of the so-called crisis. You must have heard on March 2, 2005, when uh, President Bush announced on TV that Zimbabwe is becoming a threat to the American foreign policy. A small Zimbabwe of 13 million becoming a threat to the sole superpower, the sole superpower on planet Earth. It is because of the issues at the core, the issue of land. The democracy, President Mugabe is accused of uh, a bad record, was won actually by himself and his team the liberators of Zimbabwe. We took our freedom. Freedom is never given on the silver platter. Yes. You have to get your freedom. The democracy is African democracy. We brought it and we should nurture it and uh, proceed to new horizons. But as you should understand, brothers and sisters, the war is far from over. It's That's just right. the beginning. <laughs> the beginning of the emancipation of the black, of the black people. And uh, I'm bringing the message from Zimbabwe that uh, we need the sixth region of Africa. We need you now. The, the imperialists are not going to bed. They are back on the drawing board. They are working day and night. Because that precedent set by Zimbabwe is threatening, like Bush rightly indicated. Because, because it has never happened in the history of blacks that we go out there to claim what is rightfully ours for the very first time. And let me assure you, brothers and sisters, land reform in Zimbabwe is irreversible. 
whoever, whoever uh, entertains or harbors the slightest notion that there will be a reversal of what happened in 2006 and what we concluded in 2005 would be making the biggest mistake of their lifetime. And let me thank brothers Ajabu, who I had articulated the Zimbabwe case here yesterday, and you have just heard him. Uh, our brothers, Congressman Charles Barron, mm -hmm. our brothers, I've just got to know them. Excuse me, I hardly know anybody. I'm here for my second time. I mean, in, this is my second year, and this is my first time here. And, uh, but excuse me, we'll get to know each other much better. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I've been meeting in Washington, D.C., the Black Lawyers Association, the Black Farmers Association, and uh, the Black Doctors Association. Yes. I'm deliberately targeting these brothers and sisters to focus their attention, to get them to understand the core of the Zimbabwe situation, what is at the center of the Zimbabwe situation, and to win their hearts and minds, to refocus their minds on Zimbabwe, not tomorrow, not next year, but now, because what happened in Zimbabwe and what's happening now in Zimbabwe is still in isolation. One might think a replica of what happened in Zimbabwe is going to catch up in South Africa and Namibia. Definitely it will. But the White West is fighting tooth and nail to make sure that does not happen. They're actually trying to neutralize this to be of lesser impact because their interests are at stake. Uh, 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 uh. The stakes are high, brothers and sisters. The stakes are really high. They say Mugabe is old, you should go. Mugabe has always wanted to go long back. Who expected Mugabe to turn his back? <coughs> Without delivering land. Land is his legacy. That's what he has ever fought for the rest of his life. We lost hundreds of thousands of people in the struggle for land. Those who are familiar with Zimbabwe, they, will, they know what is meant by Manawevu, the son of the soil. That's a slogan that spans back to the 19th century. You know the first Chimurega War, the 1893 to 1898. The second Chimurega War of 1966, right after the independence, it was about the soil, the land, its minerals. It is the first right the right to life. We got the political independence. And in 2000, we started a very long journey, the final journey, the emancipation, economic emancipation of the Zimbabwean people. The road has been hard, it's still hard. This time around, we're not going to win it on our own. Right. We need your brothers and sisters. Right. <clears throat> Get this from me. We need you today. I'm not quite used to speaking to public fora like this one. I've invited people individually in groups at my embassy and uh, intimate with them to discuss 
in detail. You know, what we're planning to do, the hardships we are facing in the country. We have received support, but there is no plan of action, brothers and sisters. We need a plan of action, and especially from our most experienced observer mission in the USA, like Brother Lomé said, I was listening carefully. We are the most conscious outside Africa. It's heartening to be speaking to you today and to hear from you your support, your unreserved support, your unconditional support. But um, I'm seeing very little coming from the Black Caucus, from the intellectual of our South region. Our celebrities. Those people we thought that uh, they will come to join us in this fight because <laughs> we have a mammoth task. If we don't do it now, because the imperialists are determined, Zimbabwe is a fry in the ointment. They want to pluck it up and throw it away because it's quite a bother. It's a challenge to their interests. It has never happened in the history, of, in the post-Cold War world we live today, that a small country like Zimbabwe, you know, a wretched country poor, they say, would challenge the Almighty. The most powerful country on earth. The transatlantic link, the relations we see, has converged. You know, the G8, that converged into Africa. We are seeing a new scramble for Africa now, but Zimbabwe is standing on the way. <coughs> the EU Africa summit has failed to take place three times. The SADC US summit has failed to take place twice. So many resolutions against Zimbabwe's record of human rights, sponsored by Western governments, failed to pass at Geneva several times. There is now an attempt at the UN. You had the debate, Juga Strip. You had about um, Attempts to attack Zimbabwe uh, to involve the UN system, you know, in the Zimbabwe issue. There is concerted effort from every angle to ensure that Zimbabwe is choked. They chalk Zimbabwe and to ensure that that does not succeed because the precedent set by Zimbabwe itself is very dangerous for the imperialist world. This is why I'm saying it is now that we refocus our attention on Zimbabwe. Our failure to do that, ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, we aren't going anywhere. We might meet here, sympathize, share our views, reiterate our what we call our solidarity with Zimbabwe. But I'm telling you, if we don't have a plan of action, we are not going anywhere. You hear, you hear every day inflation in Zimbabwe is 600 percent. You know, Zimbabwe is, you know, uh, uh, agriculture is disruption on agriculture in Zimbabwe is continuing. Farms are still, you know, being occupied, you know, farm occupation is continuing in Zimbabwe and so on. All the negativity you hear every day in Zimbabwe today is directed at that, choking the Zimbabwean economy. They continue to tarnish to make sure that Zimbabwe actually is seen as the worst case scenario in Africa. 
that precedent set by Zimbabwe itself should never, should never ever be entertained. They are saying. So, my office is open in DC. I want to network with you, brothers and sisters, uh, so that we come with a plan of action. My brother Jabu did mention here that we have to come up with a petition, a resolution. Let's reach out to those privileged, you know, in the sixth region. I'm concerned very much this time when I go to the capital here and I try to make an appointment with staffers. Um, we discuss a lot, but we are not going anywhere. What is wrong? Help me identify the problem. You're most experienced. You know who's where. You know who has the capacity to make a difference. You help us identify these and run our support for Zimbabwe. Because if we don't do that now, the imperialists are closing in and they are good at it. Some among our African leaders are already turning their back. You must have heard about this. And we witnessed often in DC. One African leader comes in at the White House, show first page on television. Five of them they are there, lines of credit extended, debt forgiveness is offered. But if any one of you watched the BBC last night, you must have seen uh, children paraded on television. You know, suffering from malnutrition, said to be in Zimbabwe. And the president immediately after that, the pictures is, is brought forward with the president celebrating his birthday. The image they are projecting to the world. Direct misrepresentation of what's happening in the country. Well, my wish is to see that uh, uh, our sixth region rediscovers itself, redouble your efforts. Make sure that uh, our sympathy translates, our support translates into real action on the ground. Let us be heard. Because surely we might meet several times, as many times as we wish. But if our efforts don't translate into action, and surely we are not going anywhere at all. Because the imperialists have the power of the media. They have the money, they have the capital. You had three, four days back, the renewed sanction on Zimbabwe. They call them targeted sanctions. And yet those are comprehensive sanctions. And you know who those sanctions hurt most. The general public Zimbabweans. The idea is to 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 to, to cause an uprising in Zimbabwe. An orange revolution, so they say, which is now fashionable these days, to chop Zimbabweans economically so that they turn against their government. And Zimbabweans know it pretty well. They say the countryside is illiterate, Mugabe's electorate is illiterate. 
that is the most literate political constituency in Zimbabwe. They know it. They went through the war. They know the hardships they are going through. But surely, those hardships will finally come to an end. Everything comes to an end. You know it, everything really comes to an end. But things don't come to an end by themselves. No, they don't. When we took our freedom, we took it. It was never given to us. Now, we are taking our wealth for the very first time by Africans. It's not given to us. Nobody is going to give to us. And we will do it. We would rather die for that as well. Because <laughs> what is death after all? We've lost so many people, hundreds of people before. And this time, you know, we, 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 death does not heal. Yes. We'll proceed and do it. It's irreversible. Yes, we are taking African wealth back to its rightful people. And we want our brothers and sisters leave no stone unturned. And others just were saying, okay, my brother, what is this that we hear about human rights? A learned lawyer. You tell me a human right that did not exist in, until 1980. Huh? Since 1893, blacks never voted. We fought. Hundreds of people died. Huh? We won that war. We brought for the very first time the blacks voted for the very first time in their lives. Hmm? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. We brought the human rights. Where were they? Where were they all along? Yeah. They're teaching us about human rights today. <laughs> Democracy today. Yeah. Oh, then I'm sorry. Then we, that democracy would rather have our democracy what the, the democracy we brought. That's the kind of democracy we're gonna have. But we know they don't want the kind of democracy we have. Democracy is quite a relative term. It means something else to, every, to, to different people. We have to give ourselves that democracy. Not the kind of democracy they want to give us now. They're actually championing it. And we won't tolerate that. We want this word out. To you, brothers and sisters, like Brother Lombe said, you are African observers in the US. Your experience that spans two centuries, five centuries back, 500 years back, we need it now. Refocus your attention on Africa, especially now. And don't let go. Please don't let go. They say the succession issue. Huh? They are trying to tell the world that uh, there is no succession in Zimbabwe. Mugabe is going to die in power. That's not true. ZANU PF has a mechanism. It has a plan in place. But its agenda is not done yet. Including the plan of action. The role, the every role, brothers and sisters, to play in Africa, beginning with Zimbabwe, because the precedence has been set. Thank you, brothers and sisters. If you have any questions about that, we can respond. I appreciate it.
a bit louder. And, and for those of you who are standing, please stay standing. For those of you who are not yet standing, make it rise. We don't want you to stay standing up because there's a powerful energy from the words that Brother Wilbert Guashamangu has just shared with us. And I want you to, you know, we were sitting there trying to listen and imbue, but I want you to feel it right now. Taking a deep breath, and as you breathe, breathe in, raise your right fist. And as you exhale, let me hear it. Free the land! Give thanks. You may be We're going to hear from a few more speakers over the next several minutes, and then we'll take a short break from a list of powerful, powerful presenters just to stop and cleanse our own minds with some of the questions and comments that we may have. So we'll take a bit of time for a question and answer session. So just in this moment, we'll have somewhat of a brief interlude with the FOI in the moment that they're making these short changes. Why don't you just go ahead and give a round of applause for the brother.